I can't believe I'm doing this. Hi everyone, it's me. And today, let's understand, respect everyone, together. Quick, who's the first presidential candidate you think of this year? Yep, we're talking about him. Welcome to Film Theory! Hello Internet, welcome to Film Theory. Do remember that this video came out in the year 2016, so let's be understanding. This video is 5 years ago. Thank you. Now fortified with 150% of your daily dose of knowledge. Now producing this show forces me to stay pretty darn up to date with my TV viewing. It takes me to all sorts of programming. From killing zombies, to rose ceremonies, to yelling at people who have no idea how bidding works. Come on people! When you're the last person to bid on The Price is Right, one dollar is the best option. What? It's called really? playing the odds. Huh. Huh. Interesting. The more you know. Hmm. So is one dollar bet is the best if you're the last individual? Huh, did you know that? Did you know that? <laughs> But lately, there's been something interrupting my nightly dose of modern family. The election. But not okay. just the election. One man in particular. Donald Trump. Mr. Trump. Donald 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 Trump is everywhere. And sure, when you're on the short list of people who could be the next president of the United States, you should plan to get some media exposure. But it seems like every election story has been about him. And he's just one candidate out of about 300 who entered. For someone who's never held public office before, he's doing really well. His candidacy started as a punchline, an are you kidding me moment in an age of shameless publicity stunts. But as of the writing of this episode, he just won the New Hampshire primaries. Which is good since I've been working on this episode for a while now, and if he suddenly tanked, all this work would have been wasted. But this whole time, I keep asking myself, how? I mean, don't get me wrong, I like The Apprentice as much as the next guy, but why would people want a real estate tycoon to be president? How does someone with no experience dominate a race full of veteran politicians? I mean, before this past year, the thing that most interested the public about this guy was his hair. Seriously, is that a toupee or not? So I've been following what Trump has been doing, and I was surprised by what I found. Trump's campaign tactics are unusual, but I've seen them before. Not from politicians, but from reality TV contestants. Donald Trump knows how TV works, especially reality TV, and he knows what kind of players are the most likely to survive to the end. And after today's episode, you will too. So if you want to become the next front runner for your nation's elected leader, stay tuned, because I'll show you how in four easy steps, with the help of our good friend, the Don. Now this comparison of an election to reality TV might seem absurd at first, but think about it. Both are contests with a cast of characters who have cameras rolling on them all the time. Just like the Channel E and shows like Entertainment Tonight cover the latest news about the Kardashians, channels like CNN and shows like the Nightly News cover the election. It's all news, and it's all entertainment, just with various degrees of substance, most of the time. Trump is the one who seems to be most aware of the camera, the one who wants this race to be as much a spectacle as it is a political discussion, and the Washington Post says he uses Twitter far more prolifically than the other candidates, so he's clearly playing the game in a more modern, media-savvy fashion than his opponents. In the first several months, of his campaign, that reality TV style of self-promotion and gamesmanship has been translating to voter support. And so, my fellow humanoids, here's the reality show blueprint that Trump has been using as his ultimate Trump card. Sorry, that pun was pretty ham-handed. Step one, create a clear persona. Reality shows have big casts, and a limited time to introduce viewers to them. So the simpler and more memorable someone's persona is, the better. Pop culture philosopher Chuck Klosterman notes in his book, Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs, that reality shows like the real world, the granddaddy of reality TV, put a lot of effort into boiling down their participants into oversimplified archetypes, like the guy who plays the race card, or naive southern girl. Think about some of reality TV's most iconic moments and characters. Johnny Fairplay from Survivor, who lied about his grandmother's death to stay an extra week on the show. My grandmother's sitting home watching Jerry Springer right now. Villain, Puck from the real world, who wore a Nazi swastika shirt and refused to remove it when he was asked to by his Jewish housemate. Villain. Amorosa from season one of The Apprentice, who wrongfully claimed that other contestants were racist. I called her a baby. I told her to go in the corner and get her 
pacifier and her blanket and go cry, which is what she always does. Villain. Huh. It's funny how many of the first examples to come to mind are villains. Interesting. But if you really want evidence of this trend, look no further than shows like The Amazing Race, where all teams come packaged with a one-line identifier. Dating. Newlyweds. LGBT YouTubers. Wait, Tyler? Tyler, what are you doing on there? And, and Bernie Bur Bernie Burns! Well, fine, yeah. I see that neither of you wanted to be my partner. That's okay. My feelings aren't hurt or anything. Mm. In all seriousness, though, recent seasons of Survivor have stopped trying to hide it all together. Heroes versus villains, brains versus brawn versus beauty. It's like high school all over again. Jock, nerd, girl with loose morals. We as humans just like to classify. It's more efficient. If I say, man, that guy is such a jock, you already know a lot about him without me having to explain his whole life history. And if you're picking one candidate in this year's presidential race who doesn't care about getting along with other people and fits into a few simple categories, it's Donald Trump. Whether you pay attention to politics or not, you know what kind of qualities Trump is using to identify himself with. He's a businessman, not a politician. He's rich. He's famous. He's successful. And he's not afraid to say whatever pops into his head. Depending on your perspective, he's either a bully or a no-nonsense outsider. But either way, Trump has labeled himself better than any other Republican in the race. Other candidates are more experienced, to be sure. But can you put Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz into a box that easily? No. And that makes him a lot harder to follow, because it requires more effort to know who they are and what they stand for. At this point, everyone knows who Donald Trump is and what he stands for. He has the clearest persona. Step two, stick to a message. When you're filming a reality show, you get a lot of footage. The Biggest Loser, for instance, has 11 cameras running for 8 hours a day, 7 days a week. That's 616 hours of footage to make a single 42 minute long episode. So if you have something to say, you'd better make it simple and you better make it quick. The number one slot of pretty much any great greatest reality TV moments of all time list tends to go to the infamous snake and rat speech from the final episode of season one of Survivor. This was an electric moment of television. In it, truck driver Sue Hawk delivers a scathing speech to her former alliance mates, equating one to a snake and one to a rat. But if I were to ever pass you along in life again, and you were laying there dying of thirst, I would not give you a drink of water. And encouraging the voters to follow the course of nature and let the snake eat the rat. It's so memorable because it's so simple and direct and honest. And as a result, it's endured for decades since it was first uttered. Or if you want an even better example of sticking to a message, look no further than Dr. Will Kirby from Big Brother. Never before has a clearer case of sociopathy been put to film as this man, the self-proclaimed puppet master. It's gonna look like flesh on the outside? You rip it open, and it's just circuitry and wires. But what makes him so special? In the second season, he repeatedly told everyone to their face that he would lie to and betray them on the show. And he did! Week after week, his teammates would get backstabbed, and yet they continued to trust him until he eventually won the whole show. He won the show! But when I say that he stuck to his message, he really stuck to his message. When he returned in the All-Star season, he did it all again. Literally telling everyone in the house in the first few weeks how much he hated them. So I had a heart to heart with myself and I said, Will, what is the reason? Why are you having such a hard time playing? And this is the truth. I can't find an individual to hate because I hate you all. And then went on to make the final four and ensure that his best friend would take home the grand prize. But it may well be that Donald Trump learned to simplify his message from one of the contestants on his very own show, the breakout star Omarosa. Lover, hater, or love to hater, Omarosa always stayed direct and on message, including when she coined what has become one of the most famous mantras in reality TV. I didn't come here to make friends. I said that from day one. Omarosa wasn't secretive about doing whatever it would take to win, and she won a lot of fans over with that level of honesty. Suffice it to say that Donald Trump is probably not running for president to make friends. No, <laughs> just like Omarosa, he's trying to win. And in case there's any doubt, he talks about winning constantly. Winning. We have to win in Iowa. I'm gonna win. I think I'm gonna win Iowa. Man, that guy toots his own horn a lot. You might say that he's trumpeting his success. Trumpeting. Alright, alright, that was the last Trump pun, I swear. When it comes to Trump's message, he keeps it simple and punchy. In fact, his message is so simple, it's comprised of words kids could see on Sesame Street. Tough. Win. Great. One syllable at a time, it doesn't get much easier than that. Kinda reminds you of hope and change a couple years ago, huh? And the easier it is for people to understand your message, the easier it is for them to get behind you. Step three, bring the drama. Let's face it, our favorite reality TV personalities aren't always the most mentally or emotionally stable. But those 
Those kinds of people are also the producer's favorites, because you never know what they're gonna do next, and that makes for exciting television. We've already talked about a lot of other examples, but the one I'd like to focus on here is from one of America's finest artistic achievements, RuPaul's Drag Race. If you're unfamiliar with the show, RuPaul's Drag Race has nothing to do with souped-up cars. It features drag queens competing in competitions ranging from fashion to stand-up comedy to lip-syncing, and yeah, you can bet there's plenty of drama to go around. Stop, cause you do a lot of talking. You been everybody's BFF and kiki 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 kiki. No, this is not RuPaul's best friend. No, Ray. Sherlock. The best came in season four of Drag Race, which featured Chad Michaels, a dead ringer Sharon impersonator. I'm Cher, bitch. Sharon Needles, who is equal parts punk rock and comedy, and Latrice Royale. Get those nuts away from my face. But in a field of talented, funny drag queens, it felt like one in particular, Fifi O'Hara, was dominating all the airtime. How? By bringing the heat to anyone and everyone. Everyone hated her! She was the worst! I hated watching her! It was awful! But at the same time, I couldn't look away. At least I am a showgirl, bitch! Go back to Party City where you belong! Similarly, nobody on the campaign trail this past year has had or created more beef than Donald Trump. He started so many fights, it's a surprise that Vince McMahon hasn't hired him on to be a professional wrestler. Actually, Donald Trump, yeah! The list of people Trump has bashed is lengthy. Fox News reporters, fellow Republicans like Ted Cruz and Jeb Bush, and of course, Hillary Clinton. Combine this with Trump calling Mexicans rapists and proposing a ban on allowing Muslims to enter the country, and Trump has been all over the news cycle since the moment he declared his candidacy. They say that any publicity is good publicity, and Trump is definitely winning that game. According to the Washington Post, from June through November, Donald Trump had more airtime on the news than the entire Democratic field combined, and about a quarter of all news time total, in spite of the fact that he had to split that time with 20 other candidates. With that amount of free advertising, it would be more surprising if Trump weren't in the lead. I mean, look, it must be effective. You don't see me making film theories about other candidates. Touché, Donald. Touché. And finally, step four. Stay one step ahead of your opponents. In reality competition shows, the best players are the ones who can read their opponents and disguise their strategy. Let's take a look at the player host Jeff Probst called the best player in the history of Survivor, Russell Hance. Never before has there been a clearer example of sociopathy put to film as this man. And that's including Dr. Will. Russell played the game three times, he was a finalist twice, and the one time he wasn't a finalist, his own team lost on purpose because they were so scared of him. What put Russell on everyone's watch list was that he broke the game, circumventing rules that everyone had just assumed were in place. Specifically, he found the hidden immunity idol, the item that protects people come voting time before having any clues about where it was or the show telling them it was a thing that existed. I think I just found the second hidden immunity adder without a clue. <laughs> He convinced a player on the other team to give him an immunity idol on a season in which the show itself labeled Russell as a villain. You don't hand the enemy the idol, especially when his name is Russell Hands. You don't do that. He even resorted to psychological warfare against his own team by pouring out their water and burning their socks in an attempt to break their spirits. As Russell put it himself, if I can control how they feel, I can control how they think. This man, he is like a hero to me, in only the way that like a super villain can be like someone that you admire, you know? Anyway, now look at Trump. Trump's opponent spent most of January drumming up as much support in Iowa as possible. Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio each held twice as many events as Trump did. But Trump played a wild card with a surprise endorsement from Sarah Palin. Palin's speech was mocked by a lot of people, but Trump was able to stay in the limelight ahead of his competitors through one single event. And remember, this wasn't just any endorsement. This is Sarah Palin, a political figure who is very divisive. Someone who the sheer mention of her name drums up emotion with most voters. And that gets attention. Who cares about a bunch of stuffy events? Here's a news story I can really get headlines with. And then, two days before January's final debate, Trump just decided to hold his own Alley instead of attending it. Like Russell, he's breaking the game, challenging rules that everyone just assumed were in 
place. I mean, who skips debates? It's unheard of. This made headlines in its own right, but now think about his opponents. Trump had spent so much time criticizing and insulting the people on that stage, you know that they were prepared to go on the offensive. But at the last minute, he pulls the rug out from under them and doesn't show, putting them off their balance and forcing them to rethink their approach. Well, it worked. Who are they going to attack now? The Washington Post notes the candidates switched more of their attacks to Ted Cruz in Trump's absence. Throughout his whole campaign, Donald Trump has differentiated himself by not following the beaten path, and in doing so has tried to control how his opponents feel when he attacks them. Because, like Russell, if he can control how they feel, he can predict how they'll think, and more importantly, how they'll react. So congratulations, you now know the four steps to being a front runner in your presidential campaign. But here's the thing, Donald Trump has a lot of things going for him. He has the clearest persona for everyone to understand, he keeps his messages simple and is able to dominate the conversation, he brings enough drama to keep voters' attention, and he can even predict and undermine the moves his opponents are about to make. So obviously, he has to be a lock to be the Republican nominee, right? Well, not necessarily. Because while all these steps are critical to making reality TV stars, they don't necessarily create reality TV winners. Omarosa, Fifi O'Hara, and Russell Hance got relatively famous, but they all lost. Puck was the most famous person on the real world San Francisco, but he was evicted from the house midway through the season because everyone hated him. And this isn't even a show where evictions are a thing that exists. They're just supposed to live together. You're not voting people out. Of everyone that we talked about, Dr. Will is the only winner. And that's because, man, this guy is charming. He is so awful, but he is so, so charming. Do you think it's easy being this good looking? It is easy. In short, Donald Trump is like a survivor contestant who emerges as an early leader. He's gathered support, gotten a lot of airtime, but now his tribe is trying to bring him down before it's too late. In this case, the tribe is the Republican establishment, and the endorsements made by Republican governors and members of Congress are like votes in the tribal council. The endorsements in favor of Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and Jeb Bush continue to climb, while endorsements for Donald Trump are few and far between. Republican leaders worry that this guy's an embarrassment, that they won't be able to get Trump to compromise, that he's not the kind of guy who'll sit down to dinner and meet you halfway, like some sort of lady and the Trump. Sorry, Honest Talk, I, I have a serious pun problem. I need like some sort of pun addicts anonymous. Hello, my name is Matthew Patrick, and I'm a pun addict. Anyhow, the Donald is starting to feel the effects of the Republican establishment's backlash. After leading the polls for most of the few months leading up to the Iowa caucus, he finished second, receiving well below the percentage of the vote he was projected to get. Trump's not done fighting yet. Like I said, he won the New Hampshire primary, but there's definitely blood in the water. If the parallels between Trump and our reality stars are any indication, he might be able to outwit his opponents in debates and outplay them in the media game, but he probably won't outlast them. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Mr. Trump, quick question. What would you say to someone who thinks you're acting more like a reality TV star than a presidential candidate? You're fired. <laughs> Like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Comment down below. Follow.